Bible studies focusing on the cross of Christ. Welcome today to a study in the Word. This is Evangelist Jimmy Swagger, along with Lauren Larson, Dr. David Watts, Dr. Don Paul Gray, and Dave Smith, and you. It's a delight, I want you to know that, to be with you today, have you with us. We're studying some of the most important material in the world. How well we elucidate this material is is another question. But the material itself is just phenomenal. And um, some of the brethren said they had some statements they wanted to make when we come back. We'll start with Dr. Watts. Well, just the the uh, part of the passage, verse 26, that Brother Larson read, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So Martin Luther struggled with this, said, if God is just, then everyone deserves to go to hell. So when he read Romans for the first time, he struggled with this point. God is a just God, then that means everybody's guilty. Everyone deserves to go to hell. So how could he be the just judge and the justifier also? So the justifier, he can, instead of saying that everyone deserves to go to hell, now he can give us a pardon and say we're pardoned of our sin and we don't or we can we don't have to go to hell why is that and it was because of our faith in Christ and what Christ did at the cross is the way that God is all is a just God God is a holy God God is a is a you know cannot accept sin but in his justice in his sovereignty he still made a way that he could also be the justifier and give us a pardon for sin. He's the only one who can be the justifier. That's because a- that's what you said a while ago is correct. All men have sinned. Yeah. And uh, born in sin, to be frank with you. And um, that that shows us the door immediately. Yeah. We, we're not capable of, of justifying anybody. Yeah. But the penalty for sin had to be paid. It had to be paid. And that the previous verse use the term propitiation, the substitute, the substitute sacrifice. I don't know why that he had such a problem with that. I don't quite understand. That's what he struggled with because he had only read the Old Testament and he had had an Old Testament view of God until the older priest told him, Brother Martin, have you ever read the New Testament? And he said, no. And he began to read the New Testament and it changed his life. He said, not only is God a just God and the just judge and we all deserve hell, but now he's made, he's also the justifier and he's given us a pardon. The pardon of sin is the propitiation mentioned in verse 25, the substitute sacrifice that had to go in our way and that's the person of Christ. So God in his holiness and his righteousness, we all deserve sin, we all deserve to go to hell, But thank God he pardoned our sin and he has justified us. So he's the just judge and he's the justifier. And he's the only justifier, like you said, only Christ could be the propitiation of our sin. Because he paid the price at Calvary's cross. Dr. Gray, you had something. Well, uh, just to elaborate further on that, I grew up in a background of holiness and legalism and when you grow up in that, my dad was a strong, uh, uh, what's the proper word, uh, legalistic type dad. He, he required things out of us. We had to work hard. We had to do right, and, and we did. But when we did wrong, you know, he was pretty hard on us. So I grew up with that. I, my mother would show more mercy and more grace. Uh, and, and I can tell you that I I saw the Father God more like my dad than my mother, and I had to work through that in my younger adult years. And I'm glad by the study of God's Word, I've learned that, yes, God is a judge, and He uh, has ordered the universe to operate in a certain way, but He has such a huge heart of mercy, and He's quick to forgive. So the more I've studied that, the more I I know that when I come to the Lord with my frailties and my problems and my my mistakes, my sins, He's quick to forgive us. I 
I think, Brother Swigert, a lot of people are like me. They come from that legalistic background and they just don't feel that God loves them that much. Or maybe we have to work our way back into his good graces. But we don't have to. We just have to come by faith, be truly repentant by faith, and we believe that he paid the price and we accept that. Or that we have failed so many times the devil tells us he's tired of fooling with you. Yeah, that he's yes. tired of I had, a, I had a young man at my church. He, he told me, he said, Pastor, I feel like God is just waiting every time I mess up to thump me on the head. He's just waiting to, to just hit me on the head and knock me down and that he's just, you know, there to every time I mess up because he, he was now... What he was struggling with is what at the time I wasn't uh, as well, I didn't know as well as how to really overcome sin by the cross. But I told him, like Dr. Gray said, God is a loving God. He's a just God, but he's a God of grace and mercy. He's not just waiting there to thump us on the head every time we do wrong, but he's there to, you know, he, he's, a, he's a God of love. We, we come to him no matter how many times, he's not going to turn us away. Isn't the cross... What makes it possible for the Lord to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But it's the cross that, that makes it possible for these wonderful things to be done Absolutely. Absolutely. within our lives and within our walk before God. And... Um, it, it was it was the cross that addressed sin, yeah, as nothing else could. Not only is at the cross is Christ made the justifier, but He's also the sanctifier, and He's also the way that we are able to be justified before God and to continue to live for God and to live in victory and have victory over sin. Right. The idea here too, there's a question in the mind of the Jew, can God truly do this and be right? And Paul clarifies it. He's just, he's right in what he's doing. The approach to salvation, Paul would write in Ephesians, says that God is abounded in all wisdom and prudence. Well, he can do it because he paid the price for it. Right. Yeah, but he's just, he's just in the way that the plan has come together, and he is the justifier. So it all works together, uh, pointing to God's plan as the right thing, and really the only thing that would have solved the problem for humanity. But it's up, up to us to have faith that what he did at the cross suffices. That's right. It's up to us to have faith in that, and I think some people have a problem with that. Well, it's, it's the only means by which God could offer salvation to all men because it's across the board the same. That's one reason why he's just. It doesn't vary from Dr. Watts to Dr. Great to Dave to myself to you. It doesn't vary based on the sins we've committed. It doesn't vary at all. It's faith in Christ alone that allows God to offer the same uh, salvation with the same benefit to each and every human being. He's just in what he has done, abounding in all wisdom and prudence. I don't, I don't think there's any greater example of God's justice and mercy together than at the cross. Justice and mercy came together at the cross, and that's where we can experience the mercy and the grace of God. Well, justice demands that... Um the price that's paid be sufficient. Right. Yeah. It, it cannot be sidestepped or sideslipped. It's got to be sufficient, and it was. And, and how was the price paid? It was because of his love. For God so loved the world right. that he gave yeah. his only begotten son. Dr. Gray mentioned uh, his parents. Uh, a lot of parents... Uh, require someone to earn their approval and their love, their kids to earn their approval and their love, and that's wrong. Uh, that's why a lot of people grow up. A lot of times we see God in our parents. We transfer how we dealt with our parents with, with God. Right. And that's why people, to a large extent, uh, try to earn God's love and approval. Well, we can't, No, but it's there. Yeah, it is, right. 
None of us would be here were it not there. You know, the statement says, Paul's and the justifier of him, the pronoun him refers to all of us. That's correct. Which believes in Jesus. That's the key right there. Okay. Verse 27. Where is boasting then? This refers primarily to the Jews boasting of themselves as a result of the law of God given to them. But the principle is true for modern Christians as well. And so where is boasting? What, what do we have to boast about? Brother Swigert, this... We don't have anything. <laughs> yeah, and it is, you're right in your notes. But again, we're combining Jews and Gentiles together in one. So there's a lot of Gentiles that like to practice relative righteousness. Oh, I'm not as bad as Sue, and I'm a little bit better than Bobby. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's terrible. That's the biggest yeah. problem, really. Well, that's, and so again, the boasting isn't just about uh, what laws we may or may not have keep, but uh, it's thinking that we, in, we in, in, our, in and of ourselves are just as good as someone else. We've got to compare ourselves to Christ, and that excludes all boasting. I mean, Paul's making it clear there's no room here for self-credit or self-congratulations or self-righteousness. You know, we give ourselves credit. Well, I, I'm at church every time the doors are open. Well, that's good, but that doesn't make you more saved than you know, uh, others. I, I read once where a preacher wrote and stated that he was right. When someone does something wrong and somebody else really beats up on them, they're trying to atone for their own sin mm. by, by kicking yeah. that individual. We've uh, got to break, they say, and we don't have any choice, so we'll break. At this particular time, as you can see, we are studying the great book of Romans. It is the story of the New Covenant, and it is, I think, the single most important material on the face of the earth. I believe that this book... We're back. Let's, let's make that statement again or ask that question, and I, I want to know y'all's thoughts on it, that when people are, are extremely hard on somebody that's, that's failed, is it possible, not all of them, but some that fall into that category, that they're trying to atone for their own sin, their own failure, by ridiculing the one that has failed. Does that fit? I think that can be true. You know, I, I don't mean, say it's true for all, but... I, I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of times when a preacher preaches about something repeatedly, and it's something that God is dealing with them about, and, and not necessarily what is for the congregation, but they're preaching about what they're feeling convicted about. Well, God, is, so then when it comes to disciplining somebody, they've had the same struggle, so they want to throw as much as they can at that person and make them feel better about themselves. But it really shows what we understand about God and what uh, Dr. Gray said a few uh, programs ago, that he grew up in a legalistic home his dad was very strict. His mom was very merciful. Uh, it's how we treat other people oftentimes is how we see God. And we're applying that same aspect oftentimes uh, to ourselves. But, uh, and, and that's sad because we should be able to see, based on how God has dealt with us, how we are supposed to deal with other people. If we would just think that through and say, well, they may have failed, but look how God dealt with me as I've tried to grow and I've learned. But we oftentimes don't understand the nature of God, the character of God, the mercy of God. Uh, and so we'll try to blast somebody into tomorrow yeah. over what they have done. And we'll, ju we'll judge people that are in, a pro in process of where they're at, well, we've already um, matured past that place, but we, we forget that. We forget what God has brought us from, and we just think everybody should arrive at this level of spiritual maturity, and we just we, we forget and we cast aside. We don't think about all the things that God has done well, That's self-righteousness. That's it. Self-righteousness is quick to jump on somebody else who has 
had a problem, a difficulty. Which the whole, in the church, we should be about restoration and we should be about redemption. Because God, because God is about restoration. God is in the restoration business. Right. And too often in the church, we throw people aside because they get divorced or because they have an issue or they have a problem, and we we just write them off and we say that's it. And or we say you do this for two years and maybe you can come back if you do enough. Uh, you know of these. Do things. enough push-ups. Do enough push-ups <laughs> or do enough of these. Uh, do enough Thanks. penance. Back do to enough penance. penance. Yeah. Do enough penance. I mean, I, you know, I've seen, and, and the problem with a lot of church discipline is that it's been inconsistent, and it's been about just who you know and not necessarily what you do. And I've seen some people get raked over the coals and other people get, so it's just become, when we start playing God, then it becomes inconsistent as far Very as. Very inconsistent. It, inconsistent, right. and it's, right. you know, we got to stick with what the scripture says. Not pre, um, you, you were trying to say something. Well, you, you asked the question about why people uh, don't handle this process correctly, and maybe they're too hard on the next guy. I think, to a large extent, it's what they have learned and what they've been part of. Uh, in other words, they've sort of been been discipled into that attitude, uh, and because I think that the background that we come from. As I mentioned, my background as a child being raised in a holiness home with a lot of rules and strictness and all that, uh, I tended to want to apply that in my home. And I had to really work on that. And Donna had to work on that. And the Lord had to work on me. Uh, as uh, you know, I, We raised three sons. And when you raise three boys, you've got your hands full. Particularly <laughs> my, our sons were all very rambunctious, strong hearted young men, they got that from their mother, not me, but, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, uh, we, we tend to, we tend to want to operate the way we grew up and the way we saw it. And I, and I think that happens in the church. We don't know how to show mercy, but the God, the, the job of Christianity is how many people we can explain the mercies of God to. If the whole world, Brother Swagger, understood God the way you understand God and understood Christ the way we understand Christ, they would rush to the altar of God and be saved. But they don't understand it that way. They see God as a harsh, demanding, right. yeah. uh, omnipotent person, or they try to, to pretend as if he doesn't exist at all. Donnie preached a meeting in, in a particular state not far from here. And um, the pastor of the church related this to him. They'd had a preacher's meeting um, a couple of weeks before. And um, anybody could come to the meeting, and it was a packed-out house. Uh, but it was really for preachers. The man that headed up the missions department for the Assemblies of God was the main speaker. And so the service ended. And a brother stood to his feet out in the audience and gave a message in tongues, a message in tongues, spoken tongues. And, and uh, the, the leader interpreted it. Like I said, the leader, the host, was um, the head of the missions department for the Assemblies of God. I, I knew him well. Anyway, and so... Uh, the, the the pastor that Donnie was preaching for, which it was his church in which this meeting was conducted, told Donnie, he said, he called the district superintendent, said, I've got a, a problem and I need for you to give me some counsel on it. He said, you do know who the man was that stood to his feet and and gave the message in tongues. He said, oh, yes. And he said, of course, the, the speaker was brother so-and-so who interpreted it. He said, now, you also remember that the one that, that gave the message in tongues, he's under discipline. He doesn't have any papers with us that we took him. And uh, he is, he... A qualified. Yeah, right. How how can we recognize that surely you've got to understand that the 
the, the speaker, the head of our missions department, that, and you have to admit that what he gave was of the Lord. He said, oh, yes, it was. But how could it be if the one that we've disciplined and we don't give him any credit at all, he cannot pastor one of our churches or whatever the case. He said, how do you account for this? Does the Holy Spirit make mistakes? <laughs> wow. And he said, the man stuttered around and finally said, well, I, I don't know how to answer that. I just don't know. But it, it certainly points up the problem. It would definitely, you know, and it doesn't take God six months to forgive somebody. Oh. Or two years. Or two years. I, I had a very good friend of mine. He was a young youth pastor. He was about 21, 22. He was dating a girl and things got too far. And he had he had the first level of credentials. He's dating a girl. Things got too far. His, his, she was, you know, 21, 22. She got pregnant. They weren't married. He went and he told his pastor, and they sat in front of the district. They told him what happened. And uh, this this friend of mine, when he was a young preacher, he used to go around and they would take, his pastor would take him to different events and different things. And his, he told me this story, and he said that his pastor, after this happened and after he had uh, gotten his girlfriend pregnant, his pastor told him, you know, when you have a new car, and you drive it around and you show it off to everybody, and then you act, you get in a wreck or you get a dent in it. He said, you're just not as proud of it anymore as you used to be. And he told him that's what he was like. He was like a car that had been dented, and he wasn't uh, as proud of him, and he wasn't gonna show him around. And I, I, I mean, that, I never forgot, I was in college when this happened, but I just thought, what a, you know, Thank God that God doesn't see us that way, that when we make a mistake. My friend was repentant. He made a mistake, and what he did was sin, and we don't make any excuse for sin. We know that sin right. is, is right. you know, we don't make any excuse for right. it. No. But my friend, this friend who this happened to, he's a pastor, a very, very a great preacher, serving the Lord, working for the Lord today. This was years and years ago, but just I remember just thinking, what a view, you know, thinking that you're like a dented car and we're just not going to uh, show you off anymore. And thank God that if you saw all of us spiritually, we'd be like a totally wrecked car. Yeah. We'd be more than dented. We'd be totaled. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that only, no, no, because you'd be going to the wrong body shop. Um, <laughs> the right body shop are cars that have no dent in them, just like your friend. He had no dent in him when God finished with him. That's it. He didn't remember him as a, the one yeah. that had a dent. Right. He doesn't remember those things. He chooses on. based on repentance to see us as clear and righteous and holy. Brand new car, new car smell, that's you that's and it. me. Um, and, and to fail to see how God sees people um, is a problem. That's a, that's that's, why, I'm that, going to preach that message, go to the right body shop. There you are. There that's you go. Yeah. That's, that's why we can't boast about what God has done in our life. We know who we are. We know what we've done. But we also know what he's done. Right. And he's changed our lives. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So there's no boasting in no. ourselves. Our boasting, as Paul would later say, is in God. And what he's done, what he has provided. Look, look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. That's our ministry. Yeah. To reconcile. If we don't do that, we don't have ministry. No, that's correct. That's we'll pick that up when we run out of time. We'll pick it up on the next program. Thank you for having been with us. And the Lord loved you so very, very much. The Book of Romans.